If a guy reaches out to you and it's somebody you're interested in and he says, hey, good morning, beautiful, good morning, sexy, whatever, you're like, ooh, ka 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 you like all happy and, you know, have the certain feelings. But then if there's a guy where you're just like, ew, and he reaches out to you with that, you're, there's no attraction, there's no desire for intimacy or anything like that, then you're like put off by it. Like, ugh, get out my inbox. But it's two dudes doing the exact same thing. They can send you the same message. It's just that one is welcomed and one isn't. Brave Arts community, today's guest is a speaker, a trainer, an author, domestic violence champion, and so much more. The list of accolades goes on and on. Brave Arts community, let's show some love to Dr. Marcy. How are you doing this evening? Oh my gosh, I'm so good. I'm so happy that you asked me to join you for this conversation. Um, Dating is always a good topic. It's always juicy and it can go any sort of which way so i am super excited to be here and share my thoughts yes for sure because we've had some conversations about relationships that <laughs> and i'm thinking why why is she not on the show already i gotta <laughs> make sure i have her on the show so i made sure i reached out to you <laughs> well i want to be respectful of your time let's jump into this uh because I was looking at your bio, and of course I know you, but just for those who might not, the question I had was, from seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage? Oh, Lord. Oh, you went you went straight for it, huh? Okay. Um, seeing my parents' relationship with Tommy, don't ever get married, and then seeing my mother with my stepfather sort of reinforced that, but um, it was an abusive relationship and he was a substance abuse. He was an alcoholic. Um, and so for me, it just gave me a really mixed, um, gave me a mixed message on what it means to be a woman, what it means to be in a relationship and what a relationship should look like. And so I formulated based on what I saw with her and my stepfather's relationship, um, I formulated an opinion that as long as I was financially responsible for myself and didn't have to financially rely on a man, I would never end up in an abusive relationship. My marriage would be great and everything would be wonderful. And so I bought into the the brick house on the hill, the the, the Labrador retrievers, two, two and a half kids, like the whole thing. And yeah, it wasn't, that wasn't the, that wasn't, we made it a long time, but we didn't, it wasn't, no, we didn't make it, you know? I hope that you're the one And that you are the prototype And so and how long was your uh, your mom and stepdad together? How long were they married for? Were they together for a long time? Or like you remember? So they got together when I was about five or six, and then mm. they finally split up when I was 13 because I ran away from home because of the abuse. Mm. And I refused to come back home as long as she had him in the house. And so that was a condition on me returning was for her to make him move out because she actually owned the house. And, um, you know, and that's where I got that financial, you know, misdirection because her words to me were, I don't know if I can do this on my own. I don't know if I can take care of us. Um, you know, she worked with for the state and all that, but, you know, single mom type of thing. And um, so they were, yeah, so what's that, seven, eight years? So not a super long time, but during a really formulative period, a formative period for me, um, growing up, trying to figure out, you know, puberty and womanhood and relationships and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that that had to be difficult. And that's why I want to just ask like the age range, because sometimes I knew for myself, uh, I was birthed out of adultery. So it was like I was, I, I guess what they call it, a love child, I guess they call it a love I child. I was too. That made, <laughs> look at us, look, twinning. I was too. How about that? <laughs> I know, right? Looking like what we ain't been through. We what we what we've been right. through. You know. 
Yeah, so I and and I remember just those early years and not really understanding what went on until maybe I was like 13. Um, and my mom even had a conversation with me and I was just like, what's going on here? You know, and it gave me uh, uh, a false sense of relationships, yeah. you know, growing up. So um, but anyway, this ain't about me. This is this is about you. This is why I brought you on the show. <laughs> Uh, can you tell me what, from what you have seen, what do you see the biggest mistakes women make in relationships? Discounting their own abilities um, is a big one. Um, we're much more qualified than oftentimes we give ourselves credit for. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the other thing I would say is a is a misunderstanding or misnomer about what submission looks like and. Um, the roles in the relationships. I think, you know, we've been we've been sold this this bill of what relationships should look like and what the roles should be and who should do what and who should be responsible for what. Um, but based on your skill set, based on your background, based on your history, based on your interests, that may not be what's really good for you. And so really not being afraid to talk to your partner about this is what works for me. This doesn't work for me. Like I, I knew for me, I could never be a stay at home mom. Like that was never, ever, ever, ever going to work for me. But, yeah. you know, some, so some, but sometimes if you grew up in an environment where that's what you saw your mom, she was the caretaker, she was the caregiver, she took care of her father, she took care of the home, she took care of the kids. You might think, well, that's what you have to do if you get married, but you do have the right and the ability to decide for yourself, to choose for yourself. So I think those are, I think that's maybe three things, but. Mm. No, that's, no, that's beautiful. I, I get it because I'm trying to work a plan right now to see if I can get my wife home full time because we got three little ones. Um, and, and you know me for a while, so I've started all over. I've literally started all over with the young family. So it just makes sense for her to be at home during this season. Uh, and, and two of our boys have, have autism. So it's just like, so it's a lot. So, yeah. you know, but like you said, being a stay at home mom isn't for everyone. Right. So, you know, and, and to not discount like what it means to be a stay at home mom, mm -hmm. you know, that's people think, you know, oh, you're just sitting at home or you do laundry and eat bonbons all day. Kids are exhausting. Husbands are exhausting. Life is exhausting. And, there's a lot that goes into that. And so sometimes we think, oh, bringing them home, that's, that's, you know, giving you, you know, a break or, oh, I can't take her serious. She's just a stay at home mom, but that's a hard job. It's an important job. And like, like you said, like with your kids, with having um, some, some difficulties with their autism and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that's, you know, takes that even to another level of responsibility and engagement and all that kind of stuff. So but it's cool that like y'all, it sounds like have talked about it and that's what you've come to an agreement on. You're not saying, oh, well, you need to do this. Well, I hope you're not. You're not saying <laughs> you need to do this, you know, and I know you, so I know you're not. But, um, you know, that, it's just that ability to communicate and really voice your your needs and your thoughts and your feelings. And sometimes we're always not that good at that. I'm not that good at that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you. I, I hear you. I wanted to talk to, because uh, you were married before. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, this is scary to remarry. The reason I named it is scary to remarry, because of course, you knew me from our previous marriage. And going through a divorce, I, I, ne I just never thought I would be the one who would divorce, right? Um, right. And I guess that was me on my high horse, I guess, <laughs> after I got knocked down. But going through that process, I'm wondering, do I really have what it takes to do this again? Because I didn't, I didn't give up on love and I wasn't bitter or resentful towards my ex. Um, so that's the whole branding behind it, Scary Terry Mary. Sometimes you wonder, do you have what it takes to do this again? And, and drawing up the courage and getting, putting your heart in the game again. You know, if you're going to do it, do it wholeheartedly. Um, because yeah. your ex is not who you're with now, you know, that whole kind of thing. So going through a divorce, can you tell me um, 
what was the breaking point for you? What made you actually just say, I'm done with the the marriage? So in all honesty, I quit and stayed on, meaning I knew probably nine or 10 years before I actually pulled the plug that I was not, this was not going to be a till death do us part type of thing. Um, for one, I never wanted to get married in the first place. Um, I did it going back to well, what did we learn from our family? And so I thought, well, if I marry my daughter's dad, then he has to be in her life. It's a protection for her. You know, I don't want to be a single mom. I don't want to be a baby mama. There was like all these connotations and these expectations that I had placed on myself. And so um, I actually got pregnant when we were engaged. And so um, when my daughter was four months old, my oldest daughter, when she was four months old, I acquiesced. That's the nicest way I can put it um, because he kept pushing like, wedding what do you want to do you know plant like yeah that's not my jam like that's not even my vision for my life like but how do you can't I didn't have the words to articulate that to him at the time like we were you know 20 I was what 20 I had just turned 21 years old mm -hmm. and I didn't have the words I didn't have the wherewithal I didn't have the experience to be able to say and I didn't have the courage to like hurt somebody's feelings, risk him getting mad at me. Then you don't want to deal with your daughter. Now my kid has to have live my lived experience again. And I was just like, got yourself into this and you got to follow through. Mm -hmm. And so I think I went into the marriage with knowing it was never forever. As a matter of fact, um, I made the, I wouldn't have a wedding. So we did the justice of the peace. And then I made the, <laughs> made the justice change what we said mm -hmm. from um, until death do us part to for as long as this union shall last. And it was um, love, honor and respect. It wasn't obey. Like I was very intentional. So I had, I had some, some abilities to speak my mind, but not on certain things. Like I'm like, I'm nah, I'm really not going to push that button, but if we're going to do this marriage thing, then I took my vows really seriously. So if I would have did the death to, to you, like that would have felt like a prison sentence. Like I'm doing life. I don't. And so in my mind, I went into it with an understanding that um, I'm just going to get my daughter through high school. Once she's 18, then we can. And so I'm like, okay, this is an 18-year commitment. Um, yeah, and then I didn't want my, I didn't want her to be an only child. So then we had a second child. So that adds another two years onto it. And so at that point, once I got to, we were together for 18 years, um, 16 of it married, but what something like just it was it was gone. Like there, I I couldn't. I physically couldn't anymore. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where you're just on this emotional breaking point and he just pushed me over the edge. And that's when I was like, I don't want to be married to you anymore. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, kind of a, I don't know. It's, but that's the truth. That's the story. That's, you know, yeah. things that I, things that I would do different, maybe so, like I probably wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. You know, I would have realized you you're gonna be all right as a single mother. You're not gonna you're not gonna die. Like everything's gonna be okay. But I didn't. I just had too much baggage from growing up in that conundrum of a household that I was like, yeah, I'm not trying to risk that for her. Like she deserves better than that. Like I messed up. This is this is for me to fix it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I interviewed a lady the other day and she was she talked about how she knew she was marrying the wrong person. Yeah. You know, and I was just like, like that's deep because even I've had people tell me before, I know I'm marrying the wrong person. I mean, they yeah. they getting dressed. <laughs> you know, they get they about to walk down the aisle and they like, I know it's the wrong person, but they do it anyway. What what's the 
what's the mindset? Is it is it just pressure that I just have to do this? Like, I think it's expectations. Like we have, you know, growing up, especially as little girls, like you have the whole Barbie fantasy, the Barbie and Ken dream house, you know, like we're as little girls, we're infused with this expectation of get a husband, have some babies, buy a house, you know, that's what successful womanhood looks like. And fortunately now, you know, in the age of the internet, girls and, and then boys too, young people can see a plethora of other options out there. And so, you know, people get married for different reasons. And so you may not, like, you might, might know, like me, I knew it wasn't forever, but he was, you know, he was a good worker. He didn't drink. He wasn't in the clubs. Like, you know what I mean? So he had some redeeming qualities that to me, if I'm looking at the scales, those balanced that out. So, okay, I can give a little bit here if I don't have to worry over here. And, you know, I think, I think it all comes down to our expectations and a lot of it is our upbringing. Like, what did we see? What did we experience? Like, I do work with generational systems and a lot of that stems from all the mistakes I made as a result of my generational systems. And so those are very impactful and they permeate every aspect of our lives all the way up through our adulthood until we're willing to sit down and do the work to really unpack that and do a generational review. That's powerful. Yeah. And and I wanted to speak to you about um about abuse, right? Um because there is some abuse um in a marriage, correct? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to make sure. Um, because I got an inbox the other day and a lady asked me a question about uh, a, a, a guy came over. She said they were talking, they were together. Um, I don't think they were together together, but they were like kicking it, I guess. And they fell asleep and he had sex with her while she was asleep. And she said that she let him finish. And afterwards, she was like, wait a minute, am I overreacting? Was this rape or or what? And I was like, I want to ask you about this because I'm thinking she asked me this question, but I was like, you were violated. But she was like, am I overreacting? And I was like, he overstepped his boundaries. Right. And, and I think that's a good way to put that, that he over he overreached. If she never. So the fine line there is. She mm -hmm. didn't give consent, but she didn't tell him no either. If right. That's what I'm saying. She, she was, if she had the wherewithal to know that this is what's happening and I'm going to go ahead and let him do whatever. Um, it definitely, like you said, is definitely a violation. It's definitely an overstep. Does it go to rape if you never said no? And I think that's where it's a really, really, really fine line. Because she didn't officially give consent, but she never said no. Um, and, you know, would he have stopped? Would he have, if she had, like, we don't know the answers to those questions. But the fact that she has to question herself and say, am I overreacting? No, honor your feelings and you know, be mindful, be, be present with what those feelings are. And that's going to tell you if you're overreacting, if it was, you know, cause there's a, you know, this isn't a funny topic, but there's these memes that go around that talk of, and it shows like, if a guy reaches out to you and it's somebody you're interested in and he says, Hey, good morning, beautiful. Good morning, sexy, whatever. You're like, ooh, ka 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 ka. You like all happy and you know have the certain feelings. But then if there's a guy where you're just like, ew, and he reaches out to you with that, you're, there's no attraction, there's no desire for intimacy or anything like that. Then you're like put off by it, like, uh, get out my inbox. But it's two dudes doing the exact same thing. They can send you the same message. It's just that one is welcomed and one isn't. And so is that the situation with her where maybe 
because if he's at your house and he's in your bed, there was something, mm -hmm. right? There's, you know, I don't know if it's alcohol involved or um, whatever. At any point, you have the right to say no. But the fact that she didn't say no would, without knowing all of the these details, would make me ask her, were you just not that into him? Like, you're cool with him, but you didn't want to get down with him. And there's a, again, there's a fine line there, but we have to use our voices and we have to self-advocate. And at the moment you felt the poke even coming, mm -hmm. the touch, the, you know, whatever, it's like, you know, you have the ability to shut that down. You have the right to shut that down. And we just have to get comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And then if he pursues after that point, absolutely 100% is rape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my thoughts anyway. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, so that's not a legal opinion, but. No, I, I, I get it. It makes sense. I wanted to ask you about, because you talked about, um, and this is a whole topic within itself, how there could be two guys in the inbox, because I spoke with a lady about this before, and she said it's, it's called the Idris Elba effect. I've never heard it before. <laughs> But she said that two guys can be in your inbox. One guy, because he's more attractive, he might be able to pull off more than the other guy who she's not attracted to. Right. So, so, so it's true. So, so that's a true story. I mean, I mean, it's it, so it's true. It's a, it's a true phenomenon. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But it's the same thing with, I think, you know, tell me as a guy. If you're looking at two women or two women are looking at you and one of them inboxes you or one of them approaches you, I mean, you're married now, so we know the answer is no. But <laughs> when you're single, um, was there a difference? If if it's if it's this girl where you're just like, oh, hell no. <laughs> and then you got, oh, she's bad, right? Yes. Same situation. They come, they say hi, they introduce themselves. One's going to get the smooth shoulder brush off. One's going to get the, what's up, girl? Like, am I right? That, true. That's very true. That, yeah. that, you're right. That's very true. I would imagine, though, I would imagine women would have way more guys in the inbox than probably guys get in the inbox. I don't know. But I could it be. Really right. surprised. Like, people say that to me. I'm like, oh, I bet you got, like, like I was telling you before we went on air that somebody had inboxed me today. That's a rare, rare, rare occurrence. And so, again, it's we sort of we put off a certain vibe about us, whether it's online or in person or whatever, that lets people think that they can, you know, approach a certain way, that they can talk a certain way. Like there's certain words somebody would talk to me and they would never, ever say those words. But then they would talk to my homegirl who just be about it, about it. And it's a completely different type of conversation, a whole different <laughs> language even, you know? And so I think that's the same thing with the inbox is like, a matter of fact, a guy told me one time that I'm unapproachable mm -hmm. and I'm like, I don't know if that's a me issue or if that's a you issue mm -hmm. because I'm super, you know me, like I'm super laid back. I'm super down to earth. I'm super easy to talk to. But if you don't have the courage to, you know, knock on that, that door, so to speak, am I unapproachable or do you lack confidence? I don't mm. know. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe I am unapproachable. I've been asking people like, am I unapproachable? but it's always people that know me. So they're like, no, like, no, why? But if, I suppose if you don't know me, I probably am because I'm very serious. I'm very like, Matter of fact, you know, my posts are very like, so yeah. I get it, but, yeah. you know. Yeah, because, and I can kind of see where he's coming from, and, and I know you, so it's, it's kind of a different ball game. but I can't see because the stuff that you do put on social media is so real, it's so yeah. in your face. So if I'm a guy and I'm trying to approach you, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you know what I'm saying like you know like like she's serious like I, I really gotta come with my A game yeah. if I if I decide to talk to her so I can kind of I can kind of see that 
you know. Yeah. And, um, and so that's what I'm saying. Like, I can see it too. And I know why that mm -hmm. image is there. I just mm -hmm. don't care enough to try and self-correct it. But yeah. if you follow enough, you would see, like, I have, you know, I like, I share stuff, a sense of humor, like, there's a, it's a, it's a broad spectrum, but if you dial in on what is my mission and what is my message, mm -hmm. it's always going to be about you taking control of your life. You have the power, you hold your power, and if you don't, then you need to go reclaim it, mm -hmm. and I'm unapologetic about that, mm -hmm. but I'm also super easy to talk to if you give me the chance and you don't come at me crazy <laughs> yeah I, no, I, nobody really does <laughs> yeah i hear you because I, I tell guys too because a lot of sometimes guys will be oh you know these women be in my inbox or or even if you married there's people who you know in the inbox and they playing it like they single or whatever and i'm thinking but what kind of vibe are you giving off Right. Are you giving off that vibe like it's okay for people to to come to you any kind of way? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, like I've never got the random eggplant, like nothing like I don't get that stuff. Like yeah. I never, ever, ever, ever get that. So when I hear women saying, oh, he just randomly threw that in my, girl, let me go look at your page because what are you putting out there? And then you look and it's the book. The booty popping pics yeah. is the oh I'm at the club I'm twerking it's it's a different and so if you want different you got to do different and so if you don't want those kinds of engagements and you don't want those kind of approaches then we attract what we are not what we want mm. and so we we got to be cognizant of that when we're putting stuff out into the universe mm. but and and here's here's I totally agree, but here's the pushback because this is what I get from a lot of younger people that he he shouldn't look at me like that. Um, I can wear what I want to wear. It's it's, it's it's my body. I can do what I want to do. It, you you don't have self control as a man. I can do what I want to do, and that's what I hear a lot from the from the younger younger folks. So how do you, how do you feel about that? You know, I, I do agree that, that as women, we should be able to, but we also have to understand the nature of the beast and mm. men are hunters. Mm. And when they see something they want, they hunt for it. Um, and so we have to be aware of what we're putting out there so that we attract the right hunter. Um, yes, you can, you can go out with your, with your booty out and your, your boo-boos all like, you know what I'm saying? Like, been there done it I'm not this is no judgment no shade here you know we've all been through those those phases and stages of life right mm -hmm. um and as young people yes but when you're talking from a standpoint of seeking relationships and then you're you're offended by what's approaching you you have to circle back to what is it that you're putting out there like nobody with with twelve dollars is walking into Louis Vuitton thinking they're gonna walk out with a bag, right? right? And so, can he disrespect you? No, absolutely not. Shut that shit down. Mm -hmm. Can he, you know, approach you all kinds of crazy? No, absolutely not. Shut it down. So you you can create your boundaries, but you're constantly gonna be pushing back on those boundaries because of what you're putting out there and how people perceive you, right or wrong. You may not be easy. You may not be loose, trashy. Like, I don't know what the kids say nowadays. You may not be any of those things. Mm -hmm. But if the perception in the market is that you are, then that's what you're gonna attract. And mm -hmm. so you have to be mindful that you, when we talk about controlling your, you know, controlling your narrative and controlling what's out there, like you get to determine how you show up in this world mm -hmm. and how you show up is going to, we, we teach people how to treat us. And that's lesson number one, before they ever talk to you, you're sizing somebody up visually and yeah. men are sexual, men are hunters. And so if you give them nothing left to to wonder about they gonna just assume mm -hmm. their assumption may not be correct but 
if you don't want to continue down that path and keep getting those approaches, then you have to change what you're putting out there. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. that's my feeling on that. But no, you do that's... not have to be violated and disrespected. Absolutely not. Yeah, I know. I, I hear you because there's some women that will tell me this guy, he sent this this pic, he sent this in my inbox, he sent, you know, all these explicit pictures. And I'm thinking as a man, I'm thinking, how could you like, are you that bold to send a a, a, a naked picture of yourself to somebody that you just flirting with on social media? Right. I'm just like, there's no chill like i don't know and maybe just because i'm cut from a different cloth i don't know maybe just times have changed but i think it's a culture i mean it's a culture you know what i mean so much is done and then when you think about like and i don't know if it's still like this but remember when snapchat first came out and like that was the big thing was like oh you could send whatever you could go all in and it's gonna disappear like they can't yeah tell everybody learned about screenshot (laughs) and it changed the game Right. And so, you know, social media has given us this instant access to be visible yet irresponsible for our actions. And we have to realize there is an, a responsibility with it. There is accountability that comes with it. Um, yeah, I think I think it is. I think it's cultural. I think that, you know, certain things are glorified and glamorized and when you look at what's on tv and who's blowing up on youtube and all of those things like you can put amazing content out there and get 14 likes and somebody get up there and just shake their cha-chas and they got a million followers and they getting paid by youtube like (laughs) they didn't even speak yeah you don't even know if they can speak you don't even know if they can articulate a full sentence but like i'm gonna follow you because and that's what we have to be. We got to be aware of that. Mm, yeah. It's a sad reality. It's, it's, it's true. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> I wanted to talk to you about, um, I seen your Facebook post, and I guess this kind of goes back to when we talked about your content and the background of your image. It says, a girl who grows up in a home where her father abuses her mother is more then six times as likely to be sexually abused as a girl who grows up in a non-abusive home. I had to read that for myself. I was like, whoa, can you expound on that, please? Yeah, and so, you know, our, again, that generational system that we grow up in, so what we see in our households, we're taught when you grow up in an abusive household, you have a really skewed um, view of, not only your own Mm self-worth, but what it means to be in a relationship, what value um, someone can place on you, what you have to put up with, um, all of those things. And so if you grow up in an abusive household, what you find, and this was true for me too, Mm -hmm. is you find that you put yourself in these positions seeking, um, you're seeking validation you're seeking acceptance, you're seeking um, some, maybe some things that you didn't get growing up. And so, you know, for me, speaking for myself, Mm -hmm. um, I learned that I was decent at sex, right? Mm -hmm. I learned that through sex, I could regain what I thought at the time, I could regain power with it, that Mm -hmm. I could reclaim some control with it. But you got to realize once you get in that game of tit for tat Mm -hmm. and you put yourself in certain positions, you run a higher risk for certain things, right? Mm -hmm. And that's actually how I ended up in an abusive relationship was, you know, he told me all the things I didn't hear. Like, I'm a daddyless daughter, so... My stepdad was abusive. I was molested when I was 12. I had an abortion when I was 17. Like I had no positive relationships with men. And I'm like freaking 40 years old. Mm -hmm. So I'm still, and at that point I was four years outside of my divorce. Um, So I'm like, I'm reclaiming my youth. Um, You know, I'm exploring myself. I'm exploring my sexuality. I'm exploring all of these things. And so dude came along, smooth talk, you know, to him, 
what he told me was I was the best thing since sliced bread. Like I was like the everything of everything in Arizona. Mm -hmm. But I had been with really a narcissist. I had been with somebody who was emotionally um, unavailable, like all of these other things. And so he said all the right things that I was willing to um, forego a lot of red flags, mm -hmm. a lot of red flags. One being he was married, right? Mm -hmm. And so that in and of itself should have been enough to say, let's cut bait here. And he didn't lie. So it wasn't on him. It was 100% on me. Mm -hmm. But then when he was telling stories about him and his him and his ex-girlfriends and, you know, him and his wife and these fights and these knockdown drag outs and like they like really like. In my mind, I'm like, I don't argue and I don't fight, so I ain't got to worry about that. It doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. It didn't have anything to do with who I was. It had everything to do with who he was. And so. You know, you find yourself. And so that's what happens with in those relationships. When you grow up in an abusive and dysfunctional generational system, you walk out into the world unequipped to self-advocate. You mm. you walk out into the world looking for stuff that should have been provided to you in a whole healthy, safe environment at home. And it wasn't. And so once you get out there, you out there. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. then, the, like I said, you you find yourself in these these situations and these relationships and looking for these things that that increase your risk exponentially. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about what are some signs? What are some of the red flags now that you're on the other end of the spectrum looking back? What are the signs? And then maybe you can help somebody with this who they somebody might be in the or they're about to be in a relationship with somebody who's abusive. Like, where's those red flags? Like, if he does this, then you know he's abusive. Can you give us some of those tips? Like, maybe can I help think somebody. The, the biggest one and the biggest and the easiest to observe is I call it eggshell syndrome. So, if you constantly have to second guess everything you do, how do you say something? How you dress? Where you go? How long you're at the store? Um, what routes you take home. If you're constantly second guessing every move that you make, mm -hmm. you're in a toxic at best relationship, um, bordering on abusive. It may be verbal abuse. It may be financial abuse. And so sometimes we don't see these other forms of abuse and violence um, and oppression. Like when you mm -hmm. think of it, sometimes we think, oh, abuse has to be like, he punched me in the face. Think oppression when you think abuse. And if you feel like you're oppressed and you can't speak, you can't articulate yourself, you can't go places freely, you know, you're constantly being questioned about what you're wearing. That eggshell feeling mm. is the biggest red flag. Mm. It's the biggest red flag. It's easy to recognize. You know that feeling when you feel it. Mm. Nobody has to tell you that you're uncomfortable. If you start paying attention, like, am I on edge? Like, if he's coming home, am I, am I, am I literally like freaking out? Oh my God, dinner's not ready yet. Or, oh, I forgot to pick up the dry cleaning. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're worried that it's going to mm -hmm. start like this verbal thing. It's going to start a fight. It's going to start an argument. Or you may be hit as a result of that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's the easiest, easiest red flag too and 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 that red flag will alert you to all the other ones mm -hmm. like there's lots of control things there's lots of financial controls that people put in place there you know the, the stuff that we talk about that's very common with domestic violence as far as you know separating you from your friends and your family and your loved ones you know isolation um constantly talking down to you you know demeaning you um so there's lots of those big red flags that I think we're all aware of Mm -hmm. But it really starts with that uncomfortable, like, ooh, like I, I don't feel like I can be myself or speak my mind when this person is around. Mm -hmm. Wow. This uh, has been a powerful show. I wanted to ask you about uh, the new book. I don't, is it out yet? Uh, Making a Safe Exit. Is it out yet? Or are you working yeah, on it? Actually, it is. So here's Poppy. 
Oh, wow. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the book? So Making a Safe Exit really is, I mean, it's it's a super short read. It's 54 pages. Um, and it was designed to be short for a reason because I didn't put no fluff in here. It's not about, you know, making anybody feel good. This is a brass tax, just the facts. This is what you need to start thinking about if you or someone that you care about is in an abusive relationship because it will help um, it will help you help them as well. Mm -hmm. But it really gives um, a practical approach and it teaches individuals things to think about before they leave so it teaches you how to prepare for your exit because a lot of times you know one of the things that I talk about in the book is people who love you are like oh girl you need to leave him just mm -hmm. come stay with me that's one of the worst things that anybody can do that's a last resort move and when you tell people that they don't fully understand that now not only am I at risk because the risk of domestic homicide increases three times by like 75% when you say you're going to leave or when you try to leave. And like most women who are killed are killed by somebody who they're in or had been in a romantic relationship with. And so by saying, oh, I'm going to go over and stay at Aunt Mary's house if you've been in a relationship with somebody for a really long time, they know where Aunt Mary stay. They might even have a key to Aunt Mary's house. They know where you work, where you eat, where you go to school, where your kids go to school, uh, where you go to church. There's no stone. And so you have to plan for what does this exit look like so that I can account for all of those different variables. There's a list of things in this book that tells people things, how it teaches them how to um, pack their safety bag. So as you're beginning to plan for this exit, like collecting what important documents they need to have, all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's a practical guide um, for how to plan for it. It talks to them about protecting your online footprint. It talks to them about um, protecting their, their, um, their electronic devices um, really, really, really just walks you through and it's free. There's a free ebook on my website. There's no cost for it. There, it's completely free. If you want the hard book, it's like 10 bucks. It's literally my cost to produce it and mail it. I'm not charging anything for it. It's really about getting the information out, teaching people how to prepare to make a safe exit because that is the most dangerous time in any, in any abusive relationship. Mm. wow yeah so they can mm. go to um nine seconds.org slash uh ebook forward slash ebook and it's the number nine seconds.org forward okay. slash ebook and the book is there it's downloads it's 54 pages um you know and it gives people a different way of thinking about their exit and what it means to plan for it and why it's important to plan for it. Like, especially like if you have little kids, your children have autism, right? Like you have to account for all of those variables because the snatch and run ain't always the play, especially if you have little kids. Like how are you gonna get there? Where are the keys kept? What kind of locks are on the house? Where, what? How many floors do you live in? How are the windows locked? Who has access? Who has keys? Who has, lo like all of that is in that book. Wow. Well, this has been a powerful show. Thank you so much, Dr. Marcy, for taking some time out of your day to discuss sure. uh, real uncut uh, honesty. And one of the reasons why I want to have you on the show, uh, I want to acknowledge you, Dr. Marcy, for just being a great friend. I'm I'm just glad that we still connected uh, and for speaking your truth and just being an advocate and um just making sure that you want to make sure that people are okay, you know, especially in that area of domestic violence. I think we don't talk about it enough. I think, you know, you hear, you hear it and you see it here and there, but I know you, I know you have been committed to this call for years. So to see, you know, your transition and just everything that you've been through. So I just want to acknowledge you for those things. 
Yeah. And uh, continue to do what you do. So I'm very proud of you. Uh, let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. Um, just Dr. Marcy Batiste on all social media. So Instagram, Facebook um, is all there um, for the domestic violence. If you go to nine seconds.org, there's lots of information on the website. All my contact information is there. Um, there's also um, for my podcast, Voiceless to Victorious, there's a ton of information from last year's shows. This year, I've kind of pushed it back. Instead of doing it weekly, I'm just going to do it once a month because my schedule doesn't allow for me to do it weekly. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, 50 or so episodes that just brass, like, raw. Mm -hmm. You know, people really telling, speaking their truth, um, lots of great information from a lot of great people. And that's all on 9seconds.org.